Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the panel. Um, maybe we want to go around and do a quick introductions. Each of you introduce yourself briefly, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, should I start? It. Okay, can Please. you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, Simone Pezzuto from uh, Università di Trento so in Italy. And um, I, I'm, my background is in uh, applied mathematics and scientific computing. And I, I do cardiac modeling, so we do modeling of the, of the heart, electrophysiology mostly. So we are interested in working with, with clinicians and physiologists in order to, let's say, uh, try to understand the mass the, the, as much as we can from of the heart, and then of course the idea, the dream is to go towards uh, precision cardiology, precision medicine, to, to really help uh, clinicians in uh, yeah, improving the treatments and, uh, and so on. Thank you. Hello, I'm Axel Huber from Berkeley Lab. I'm a laser plasma physicist. I work on developing HPC simulations for large supercomputers. And what we research is how we can shrink down particle accelerators by using lasers and plasmas instead of building big and long tunnels. I'm Hannah Cohoon. I'm a postdoc at the University of Utah. Uh, my doctorate is in information science, and I study those of you in the room. I'm interested in scholarly infrastructure and how it's built and how cultural movements like open science play into that use and development. Yes, hi, I'm Nina Imam. I'm the director of researcher engagement at NVIDIA. So in this role, I collaborate with the researcher community for NVIDIA technology adoption. I also collaborate with other NVIDIA teams that engage with external researchers. And before NVIDIA, I spent about uh, 20 years at Oak Ridge National Lab. So my background is in HPC and AI. Thank you very much for being with us today. This is another structure of the past conference, the panel discussion, which is inspired this year by the theme, or the thir at least the uh, third aspect or component of the theme, which is about communities and collaboration. So with this, I will give it over to Mike. I think he will yeah, start. So, yeah, we, we have a few questions. Uh, we, we can take the conversation wherever it goes, but just to get started. Uh, how do you experience computing across scales, domains, or communities within your domain? So, should I start? I'm a whoever, <laughs> the clue. whoever likes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, well, interesting question. Uh, of course, in the, um, well, in the field I, I work in, is, uh, it's multidisciplinary by, by nature, because of course we interact uh, with, uh, with clinicians, with physio physiologists, uh, with biomedical engineers. So uh, that, of course, is, uh, is a challenge from many point of view. Uh, for instance, uh, just talking, no? language, the way you interact, uh, that, that's, quite, uh, that's quite challenging uh, very often. Um, the way you present the results, uh, sometimes you give a presentation in these meetings where you know, it's very heterogeneous and, uh, well, maybe you, uh, happened to me, but this is a nice uh, anecdote, uh, where uh, I was showing the, the simulation of, of the heart, uh, but the, the view uh, was a slightly different from, I mean, it's something that for me was, was nice to see, but for, for, for a cardiologist, so a trained at cardiology, it was not really able to, so he asked me, well, from, from where are you looking at the heart? So it's the posterior view, anterior view, and I really, I mean, it was a nice discussion at the end because they, they have a specific way to. That's, that's an example, uh, of course, but uh, I don't know if you have a similar experience in, in, these, in this respect. And um, another problem sometimes is about, uh, um, uh, well, understand the, the question. Maybe they, they ask you to do some, investigate something, do some simulation. Sometimes this is incredibly difficult and say, no, this is out of question. But very often, sometimes it's something that is really feasible, it's doable, but they, for them, it's extremely difficult. They, they believe it would be too difficult to do. So it's, uh, it's difficult to find the right balance. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's nice, actually, and uh, challenging, but also very nice. Yeah, I, I think that's also the most inspiring part as well of my work is the work across domains. So we are close to experimental realizations and planning, which uh, these days you want to prepare with simulations before you build them because they're huge, huge facilities, accelerators. And then also when you commission them, so when you calibrate them to use them, uh, again, you will, will need to interact with theory and simulation to go forward. 
The, for my more daily work as well, the, the domains that we cross are actually spanning from the physics that motivates the cases we want to model over applied mathematical models that we want to develop to computer science and the implementation. Mm -hmm. And I think exactly what you mentioned is this communicating with each other and in the, making an effort to understand each other's domains mm -hmm. and explaining the science that one tries to solve in each other's domain to co come to a common goal is what is the pr most motivating. And that's across domains. I think across scales, I think, what I experience is that when you want to solve a scientific problem, you first want to, for example, model it. You start at a small scale, all right? You will explore it in a low dimensionality and then scale up. So what I find interesting is how people actually get into the domain of modeling to HPC later on and realize when you need more physics, more numerics, more, more detail and scale up. Yeah. 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 Uh, I consider myself pretty lucky because I get to study all kinds of different researchers. Um, I have looked at geoscientists and linguists and networking researchers, and it's super interesting to get to hear how processes like data analysis differ in those communities. What does it mean if your data is physical and your, the way you analyze it is destructive to that sample? It's very different from simulation data or other digital data. Um, and then also, I am representing social science on my current research team. I'm studying a cloud computing platform, Cloud Lab, and I'm the only person with my set of expertise on the team. Everyone else has a similar set, and uh, it, communication is a big deal. It's, I'm realizing that like, I need to do a lot more to explain what my work is and how I do it and why I make decisions. And they've done a great job of even just telling me what different acronyms mean. Yeah. So my team at NVIDIA mainly focuses on the AI research ecosystem. And as you know, NVIDIA has a wide range of technology portfolio across multiple scales and many science domains. Um, there are many GPU accelerated platforms that are offered from the edge all the way to exascale supercomputers that you can use for AI um, training and inference workloads. And of course, um, there are some of the uh, workstations have uh, very powerful GPUs uh, that can also enable AI application development. Uh, for example, the DTX workstations. And hardware doesn't do it alone, right? Because uh, you also have to have capable software. So NVIDIA also has a, a very uh, wide range of uh, software catalog that can be used across all of these scenarios for more efficient and productive research output um, in the cloud, in the data center, and uh, also at the edge. And um, I am part of the developer programs organization at NVIDIA. So uh, what we do is that we engage with uh, academic researchers, students, um, national lab researchers, as well as startups. And we provide a variety of services uh, to help people that are working on uh, GPU-accelerated solutions. Uh, for example, we have the Deep Learning Institute, where we provide um, uh, training material to the community. We hold the hackathons, uh, also the inception program that is specifically designed for startup companies. And I should also mention the GTC, the GPU Technology Conference, which is a massive effort. Uh, it brings together um, uh, people from all over the corporation. And uh, we hold that about twice a year. And then we invite researchers and um, uh, students and developers from all across the world to come and share their uh, research with the wider community. So, uh, hearing you discuss, it's apparent that there's a number of different um, target audiences, users, um, and you have to communicate throughout, which means some sort of vocabulary has to be developed. I would like to bring one more player, I guess, into this equation, which is society, however you wish to see it, either the stakeholders or the broader public. What would be, let's say, um, a best practice to, to try and reach out to, to include this uh, kind of audience or user into the equation? We don't have to go in turn, so whoever wants to go first. Or should we go? Yeah. I'll go. <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. All right, so yes, uh, how do you... Uh, put society as a whole in the loop, right? That's the question. Okay, so, I mean, um, 
The human in the loop is a well-known um, concept in modeling and simulation, right? Because this is where you know, a human is interacting with, with the software, or, uh, for example, something like a flight simulator. Um, now, that is being extended to the uh, AI ecosystem for, with multiple objectives. For one thing, uh, humans can um, generate um, realistic data to train the AI. It can also catch AI mistakes uh, in prediction, classification, as well as also act as an accountable entity if the system does not act as it should. But um, that human in the uh, loop is not sufficient in order to bring in the society as a whole into the, into the conversation, right? So uh, there was a paper that was uh, published um, from MIT a few years ago that introduced the concept of society in the loop. Uh, it talks about uh, how there needs to be um, uh, agreement in the society, the various stakeholders, as to what goals and values the AI system, for example, is trying to achieve. And then the human in the loop uh, concept should be extended to the society in the loop concept where you have a human uh, oversight in the system as well as some mechanism to negotiate the, uh, the values from the, the society ideas, yeah. in general. So I thought that was a, a thought-provoking publication. I think the, the way how we can evolve society, uh, specifically as a sci as scientists, right, is we always need to be responsible and be able to explain what we are doing, right? So what are, what are the reasons why we research something? What is what we found? And there are a couple of traditional methods that are just as recent today as they were in the past, which is, for example, visualization. We need to be able to visualize and communicate our results. But the same way goes also for newer techniques. So, for example, in AI ML, there's still a lot of work to do that we can actually explain why we get results. And, um, and when they fail, right? How good bias is introduced, and so on. So there's a yeah, being yeah, ex explainable and being able to explain to the society. I think is the, is the biggest point. Um, another point I think is also really through engagement on a technical level. Society has many many levels. Um, I've worked with groups that had artists as part of their physics group, for example. They are fantastic results that you wouldn't expect from having a PhD thesis uh, embedded. Um, and and other, other groups could be like industry, like, um, for example, open source software is a fantastic way to collaborate with industry. Methodologically, there's a fair amount of ways to, like, capture uh, your various stakeholders' values and make sure that you're representing them. One way in particular, or well, an obvious one to me, is value-sensitive design hit some keywords, but something else is co-design, where you actually are developing a technology with your stakeholders rather than just for them. Uh, so in my community, we talk a lot about doing things with your stakeholders and instead of like researching at them, you research with them and that can help you conceive of your technology very differently. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I was actually thinking a couple of uh, examples in this, in this respect. Uh, so, for instance, in, in, the, in the context of, of education, uh, maybe it happened to, uh, happened to me, but maybe it's to you, to, to give a lecture to high school students or, or maybe children, or try to explain to your, to your children what you're doing. Uh, and that's quite a challenge because, of course, uh, um, you have to, again, it's again language communication that we were saying before, but sometimes we give it I don't know, something for granted, like visualization, we visualize, I don't know, for instance, I use uh, Paraview, and uh, you get this uh, gray image you know, with no colors, and then you show a heart that is gray to kids, and they say, oh, does it look like a heart to me? It's, uh, it's gray, it's not uh, uh, red. Uh, that's an example. Um, or also how to, to, to engage them. For instance, we use uh, supercomputers as perfect uh, environment, of course, and they hear this word, no? supercomputers, how, how does it work? How do you interact with a supercomputer? And uh, it's also nice to show to them how that, uh, how that is done. Uh, it's, uh, maybe they don't think that, uh, I don't know, maybe they see movies or uh, you type on the keyboard something, but it, it, it's also nice to show to them uh, how this is, uh, this is actually done in reality. 
Um, and uh, in the interaction with the industry, well, it's, uh, it, um, we also have an, some experience in that respect. Uh, so, um, so, for instance, you, you have a model, say, of the heart that you can simulate uh, um, uh, arrhythmia or normal arrhythmia, and then you talk to uh, companies that they develop devices, and uh, they, of course, they are interested, say, okay, this looks like great result, but uh, what can I do with it? So the point is, okay, <laughs> Let, let's sit together and discuss uh, a specific problem no? and try to target that specific problem. Maybe your model can be helpful to target that specific problem. But we, when we build a model, it's, it's a general purpose model. So we try to, to model everything. And uh, of course, maybe you are able to answer that specific question and maybe other questions, but the company wants to know. So, so it sounds like we should bring also educators, artists, and social scientists into the loop for effectuating this. Yeah. Uh, something else I'd like to add is I, f I feel like in the past few years, I've thought actually a little bit more critically about uh, how we communicate results and how the public perceives our work. Uh, Preprints with COVID really showed me that the public doesn't necessarily understand how the scientific process isn't like a way towards certainty, it's a way towards better information. And I'd really love to see some more communication of like, what does a preprint mean? What does it mean for us? And where is it going from there? So not just the value of the work and what our answers are, but also what are these objects that we're putting out into the world and what should you think of them? Um, it's also like the communication you're saying, bringing on more people, I feel like that's very necessary. A lot mm -hmm. of the time people say researchers need to communicate their results better. You should post to, to blogs or you should be doing something to communicate with the public. But I kind of wonder if the person building climate models really is the person who needs that sort of expertise. In some fields you have professionals. In political science you have professionals who will take the research and then synthesize it for the audience that they're trying to reach, legislators and politicians, and they create a resource that is directed at those stakeholders. Having that kind of expert communicator who doesn't have to be the researcher, I think could be an excellent step forward. So it should be a community collaboration that involves multiple disciplines or skills, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. to get it through, at least to the society at mm -hmm. large, to get the message through or the result through, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe move on? Um, so so th this conference was a lot about open science, you know, and collaborative activities, community. Um, I think, I, myself, I think many of you have seen an increase in in the openness and, and collaboration, that kind of community culture. And, and so, in your own experience, what, you know, what is the importance of open science and community-driven culture in facilitating new and bold research? Yeah, no, great question. So, um, well, regarding open science, so in terms of software and uh, uh, data sharing, uh, transparency, all these topics that we heard also in this conference, I, Totally agree, of course, I'm, uh, on these aspects. Uh, in in uh, well, specifically for for my uh, let's say uh, work, uh, so working for instance with clinical data, then it's a problem. There is a problem yeah. of privacy. Mm -hmm. So you want to share? Can you? Probably you cannot uh, share this data. You need agreement. Uh, you need anonymized data, and uh, this can be, of course, uh, can be of course a problem. Uh, if you are within the same center, maybe there is no problem. But if it's a multi-center, then you have to establish agreements now to, to change this data. I know it's possible that there have been companies doing, uh, for instance, a sort of a, yeah, sort of surrogate model of this uh, data, no? you, some with generative models, so that you don't share the data, but you share the a, a, a model that can generate data with some statistical properties, say, of the, of the original one. It can be, in our case, for instance, ECGs or or imaging data, or things like that. That's, that's interesting, of course. It's an interesting approach to go, go across this, this barrier. Um, another aspect is uh, maybe about transparency. Um, I was thinking about uh, uncertainty quantification. So when we, we run our simulations, or we train our networks, uh, of course, there is a stochastic component to it. So we can reproduce the results, but what does it mean, reproduce the results? So within some confidence interval, or uh, 
the exact result. Maybe you don't even get the same figure in the paper that you, that you publish because that's normal. Um, so that, that's I also think it's, a, it's an interesting point to, it's, it's like of, a, it's, it's not black and white, of course. It's a, it's a, there is this uh, gray region that we that which also should uh, take into account for, for that. It's very important, I guess. Yeah, I think the, um, I'm, I'm lucky enough not to work with clinical data, so my uh, particles don't need um, any anonymization. But the, when I think about modeling and HPC generally at the scales that we're doing today, exascale and beyond, I think that open science is the only way to keep us actually responsible for our results and keep us open. Because if we run a simulation at exascale and create five, 10 petabytes of output, that's nothing we can quickly share over the internet with anyone. So we, we have to think about how are we actually able to keep this preserved and to be able to reproduce this, maybe not tomorrow, but in 10 years. Because in 10 years, what today is a top one supercomputer can be affordable by a medium institution. And I had this experience exactly with simulations like this, that I could do a Titan when it was brand new, full size, that at the end of my PhD, I could just run it slowly on a really large CPU cluster as well, because there was enough RAM available. Um, and it was not a top, not even top 100 machine at the time anymore. So the, what we need to think about is if we, if we have data scales and computing rates at this size, is how can we actually make our whole workflow followable, reproducible? So that means we, in open science, we have to really approach the whole ecosystem of open science. It means the education, the documentation, and of course the methods and source code that we produced our data. Right? We cannot hide them and we cannot publish them 10 years later. They have to go with the publication. And that means, yeah, we, we, have, to, we have to keep honest in that, that sense. And, and make these workflows available for everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something that I think is kind of interesting about transparency is that there's also an emotional aspect to it. Uh, for my dissertation work, I studied a platform for open science, the open science framework. And one of the key things that I was seeing is how researchers feel really vulnerable when they make their work open. It's a fear of both scooping and finding out that you were wrong, that you had some errors that someone else is going to come show you. Uh, and so this like attitudinal shift that is necessary to adopt open science practices, I think is actually a huge shift in just the way we do research and how, how we behave. Open science kind of asks us to be graceful about our own fallibility and concerns. Um, so socially, it's, it's, a big, it's a big difference. Hi. So, um, you know, a um, couple of things here. Uh, the research arm of NVIDIA is NV Research, uh, a very well-published organization. I mean, you have to just, just look around the conference, right? Uh, a very good presence from uh, NVIDIA, um, one of the best paper awards. Um, so, also I mentioned the GTC conference where we do, you know, share our knowledge and also uh, ask uh, the scientific community to reciprocate. So, we are committed towards uh, sharing of our, our research uh, and the research outputs. Uh, but let me also talk a little bit about a related concept of open science, right, which is um, publishing in open access journals. You know, that has been a part of a discussion in the scientific community. I think uh, the whole point of open access, open science, uh, uh, those kind of publications is to give uh, uh, individual researcher uh, uh, early access to, uh, to knowledge and research, and that can certainly jumpstart innovation. It can jumpstart, uh, for example, uh, technology startups. And as we have seen during the pandemic, for example, you know, what value the open and early sharing of data and knowledge uh, can achieve. It certainly expedited the development of the vaccine because of the uh, open data share, knowledge sharing, and that enables me to, you know, sit here and, uh, and talk to you all, right? Um, and also, from the individual researcher's point of view, you know, I mean, do I publish in open access or do I publish in, you know, you know through a traditional um, uh, publisher? Uh, for an individual researcher, there is also a lot of value because some studies that have been done and published, for example, by Springer, says that open access publications are cited significantly more in, uh, by other researchers 
as well as they get significantly more um, uh, online mention. So these are all um, uh, things to think about for us as a community. While we're on the topic of publications, um, it was mentioned by the opening keynote by Lorena Barba that there is this uh, aversion towards publishing failures. And today we heard Petros Komutsakos in his uh, keynote saying that, you know, when it was uh, publicized, his research was presented as uh, predicting chaos, whereas it was actually the opposite. But I guess it sounds nicer <laughs> to say that you predict chaos. What should we do, or how can we bring the concept of, you know, being entitled to report on failure, which can be very significant, uh, openly <laughs> through, through the different publication venues? It's a tough question. I mean, uh, it, you're, you find it more difficult to publish, right, a null or a negative result. Um, it's, you're rewarded for novelty, and so it's difficult to get that work published. There are, there are alternative publication methods or journals. Um, <laughs> a journal of null results is, is one example. Mm -hmm. And you could also do your preprints. Uh, community archives are, in particular, I think, a good way to share that kind of result because you're talking directly to the people who might be doing that same thing that you just tried and failed with. So uh, talking, uh, publishing uh, in a community-based archive or preprint server is, is a good option. Yeah, and I want to add, specifically when we think about evidence-based science, there's usually a database or a data basis for why there's a null result, right? Mm -hmm. You can still publish at least this data, maybe someone else needs it for a meta study for something else. It would actually be interesting also to, <coughs> to hear the, maybe the op your opinion uh, or experience in, uh, from the point of view of reviewer for open access journals, because in, in, in my experience sometimes it's, uh, it's extremely difficult to, to reject a paper some uh, open access uh, journals and uh, or that also the, the, cons the time constraint they give is, is very strict. Maybe you have to review within uh, 15 days or 20 days and uh, it's, I, I found these uh, quite, uh, quite stressful and uh, of course it's great. I, I, I fully agree with you for all the, all the positive aspects of, uh, of open access. I was just wondering about the, let's say the, the other side of uh, of the moon, let's say, or the, or the coin. So right. there are so, also some, uh, some, yeah, yeah, no, no, go ahead. So, I mean, of course, you know, what does it mean in a publication failure, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does it mean that the research, submitted research did not pass peer review? That's one thing to consider, so why? Uh, so was it not the right venue, maybe? Or was the research faulty? So all of those things need to be considered uh, because open access, open science does not mean that you do not go through peer review process, right? Because peer review process is valuable. Uh, and um, as you also mentioned, is that another point is that journal publication, book chapters are not the only methods of disseminating research output, you know. You can make your code available, uh, software available, so there are other venues of uh, sharing your research as well. There are also other models of peer review. Um, registered reports is an approach where you submit your research plan, what you're going to do, what you're, how you're going to analyze it, when you're going to stop collecting data. And so then reviewers an, like assess based on what you are planning on doing and not on the actual result. So it's a methodological, like you're, they're evaluating your rigor um, as opposed to the novelty of the result. And so then no matter what happens, as long as you followed through on that plan, you, you can get published. It's a, I think, a particularly innovative and, and hopefully transformative approach. <laughs> yeah. So, so as far as I know, that approach has not taken root in computational field. Well, how long has it been in your field? Do you, do you have a sense? It is, right? I've you, been hearing about it since 2013. Um, that's when I started getting more aware of open science, but that doesn't mean that it didn't exist before then. Registered reports are uh, particularly taking off, I think, in social sciences with pre-registration, where that um, like pre-registration tended to be in more health and biological sciences. If you're doing a, a clinical trial, you have to share what your plan is and make that public. Um, and so a registered report is kind of an, a, 
extension of that, including to the peer review process. And what drove that? Excuse me? What drove the change? Uh, a need to avoid publication bias. The fact that most published results are positive and most of my work does not turn out positive results. That was what I was talking about earlier today. Um, you are constantly surprised and it's important to share those surprises and make sure that the literature reflects what we're actually doing and finding. Seems like an opportunity for us. Yeah. yeah, that's true. One, one aspect I would like to add, what's an interesting observation that we had specifically at the PASC paper program is that open science can conflict actually with other ways that we try, for example, peer review to avoid biases. Mm -hmm. So for example, the papers that we did in last years, they were all double blind, um, which is quite complicated if someone wants to share with you their GitHub link of the source code they, they mm -hmm. just implemented and showed a new method for. So the, uh, um, there are different studies on that as well, and the, the question is how much does double-blind review avoid biases to a certain extent? And but yeah, with, if we want to be actually able to disseminate the artifacts of a publication during peer review, we probably have to give that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll take you to our next uh, theme, which is on, uh, well, still on the topic of multiple scales, domains, and communities, which resonates with the concept of diversity. And of course, diversity also means heterogeneity. So the, the question is, how do you cope? How do you endorse uh, diversity, but also cope with the results of a heterogeneous uh, team, maybe, within your uh, environment and in your research approach, perhaps? I can, I can say something. Uh, so on my team, like I said, I'm, I am the social scientist. And it's interesting because I feel like our, both mine and the people that I'm working with, our communication strategies have to change. Um, when I join the team, everybody has this same set of expertise and they're talking one amongst one another to gain consensus. And they understand one another and they can just, they can just have this conversation. Um, but what I found is that I need to do a lot more explanation of my work and why I'm doing things, and I really benefit from them doing the same thing as well. Um, another thing is that there's more documentation of what we're doing, so not just assuming that that five-minute conversation is enough to convey, but creating a resource that, that can be referenced later. We've, so it's interesting how we've just had to change our work styles. And also something that's been really helpful for me, uh, often as uh, the woman on the team, is having another mentor who can validate my experiences and give me advice when I need it. Um, I've talked with some women who are outside of my group and actually outside of my institution. And so I highly recommend that if you bring someone on who is diverse to your team in whatever way, you can introduce them to someone who has their same background, and it does not have to be from your same group. That kind of anonymity can be actually of value. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Another aspect, I think, is, is that we have to be aware that we have to ensure diversity at actually every level of our research chain and career stages. So it starts essentially with your summer students already if you're working at a university or a national lab, because this will be the time when someone decides, do I want to actually follow this path? Um, or not, right? And if, if, if I so continue to select like people that look exactly like me, then I will not have a, a diverse pool for postdocs later that will join our team. So it's really important that we check, do we have diverse people with diverse expertises, diverse backgrounds, and can really, a uh, diverse gender exactly is exactly one important point, that we actually get um, people early to identify with the research path and, and joining in there. Um, and then you have to continue there. You have to continue then in your hiring committees and ensure that you do also active bias trainings, for example. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah I also uh, fully agree. Uh, I was thinking about the uh, well, other experience we, we, we had, again, in these heterogeneous meetings with, with uh, physiologists, clinicians, and so on. And uh, you bring up a simulation, you show uh, some results. And uh, of course, uh, they, they we have different ways to, to, to look at the results. I don't know, we can, with the with eyeball metric, no, but it's, it's a different metric depending on the eyeball. No? But the clinician can see something uh, uh, different, uh, and, uh, and that's quite, uh, quite valuable because maybe we just focus on uh, just running simulations, maybe as fast as possible or as efficient as possible. We get some result, 
and then maybe the result is completely unphysiological, no? in the sense that it, it's not really realistic at all. And that's fine if you maybe present these results in a, in a conference, uh, maybe as opposed to like this one, no, that uh, we focus on the, on the computational side, but the, when you present these results in a conference that, uh, uh, I mean, presenting conferences like, for instance, cardiology, so where cardiologists were also presenting, and maybe they, you, you show results, you are very happy, and okay, we can run this and that, and then maybe they focus on that particular case, say, look, but this is not really a realistic ECG uh, at all. It, it doesn't make any sense, and then you start discussing about that. So it's very important for the team to have different uh, point of views in, uh, in, uh, in, in this respect. Uh, also, in, in a way, you want maybe to, to improve the code, because sometimes maybe you're doing things that are not necessary, so why you're you know, spending so much time in doing this that is not important from a physiological point of view. But instead, maybe you do, should do something else. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's an important uh, uh, experience, that uh, if you have a very homogeneous team, all applied mathematicians, uh, or so you don't cross the boundaries, that's something you, it's very it's impossible to, to see, because essentially we don't have the, the expertise for, for doing that. So, um, um, NVIDIA is a very diverse um, a company. Its a workforce is geographically distributed. Uh, I myself work uh, across uh, geographic and cultural boundaries. Um, so, how do we ensure um, diversity in our t respective teams, right? Uh, most people, well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people tend to think about diversity in one or two dimensions. I mean, there is uh, diversity that you're born with, I mean, uh, ethnic diversity, uh, gender diversity, racial diversity, so that those are all important and has to be taken into account, but at the same time, you also have to take into account diversity that comes from experience. So you must include uh, uh, diversity in, in uh, cross functional ac across functional areas. If you're, you know, looking around your team and all you see, you know, just engineers, well, there's a problem. Okay. Same thing goes with work experience, educational background. Uh, is your entire team? Did they all graduate from the same school? Hmm, okay, well, then you are living and working in an echo chamber, uh, which is not desirable. Um, so diversity from uh, from all of these different dimensions helps a company be uh, more innovative. Um, your talent, right? Employee um, satisfaction as well as um, uh, cater to a more um, uh, heterogeneous um, client base to address one of your questions. Yeah, I, I think it's important to have a diverse team. In diversity is uh, usually where innovation comes from, right. different ideas that just merge different and create Different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. To build on what Axel was saying and recognize that if you want a diverse team, you need to have the people with the skills who are diverse. Part of that is getting to students. Um, and one way that I've seen success in uh, retaining more diverse students is in introductory classes to have a class, like if you're doing an intro programming course, um, you can have a class where you require the people in that section to have no experience. This has been shown to actually retain people of different backgrounds a lot better, to give them a space where you're not uh, feeling less confident because they're sitting next to someone who doesn't need to pay attention during lecture. Mm -hmm. So creating these spaces where you're making uh, other people more comfortable and bringing them together based on maybe their lack of experience can be a good way to help bring them into the community and help them feel confident. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a big aspect also of psychological safety that we can continue later in HGN groups. Um, there are very good results like from Google, uh, from their teams, um, that show exactly the teams that can fail and will not be fired for failing. <laughs> And we should fail a lot if we do research, otherwise it, we do, do it wrong, right? So teams that can fail safely are more successful and have better ideas. And so we have to create these environments and have to be able to stand for our mistakes, but not like fail our careers for them, because we can just make the mistakes, yeah. I think we'd like to open it up uh, to audience members who would like to uh, come up and ask a question and make a comment.
Yes, so we open it up to you now. <laughs> Please feel free to ask questions to our panel. Yes, go ahead. Can I bother you just to use the microphone just for the <laughs> recording? Oops. <laughs> oh, you're uh -oh. also wired. Catch it. Oops. <laughs> no laptop. What about the European Open Science Cloud? What do you think about it? Did you heard about it? And uh, uh, the goal to have a more open science and a fair uh, data and fair shared data? This is more for those who are in Europe, I suppose. <laughs> so I guess you refer to the effort also uh, where the European Commission is participating in creating a cloud for data, but also for open publications, uh, essentially. Uh, for uh, numerical... Uh, and numerical... Uh, uh, yeah, including computation. Uh. I mean, maybe I will give my opinion here. I, I think it's the only way to go forth, to have such an openness. In some cases, uh, open science is now mandated by many of our funding instruments as well, at least in Europe. I, I don't know how it is in the US. And there are platforms that, such as the one that was mentioned, but others also that create repositories for publishing anything, even mm. negative results. And I really think it's, it's the way forward. And I'm glad to see it endorsed also by those who finance projects, because then somehow it becomes the uptake is more immediate, at least I, in my experience. Right. I don't know in the US if they're similar. Uh, right, so I mean, there's a related concept, of course, is the fair data principle that we are all familiar with. You know, is, um, is it findable, accessible, accessible uh, interoperable, and reusable, right? And fun funding agencies would also uh, require, in many cases, for the researcher to um, uh, record, publish, and at the same time, um, uh, Preserve data. Now, that can come with cost, so one has to balance the cost of preserving the data as, uh, and, uh, and sharing because it, it's not the same for all situations. But there is the mandate for the, the strategy that is followed by many different funding agencies in the US. The data reuse and data sharing is important. And, uh, for one thing, I mean, uh, data reuse, data sharing certainly is, you know, cost effective, right? I mean, it, you do not have to recreate the data for your own research project. You can use someone else's data. Uh, as we heard during the keynote, something that uh, could use improvement, though, is that despite we have the fact that we have these data sharing policies, there's not a lot of compliance with them. Right. And so creating the ways, it's this extra work that a lot of people are concerned about. Uh, so creating ways to automate that process, to make it part of the publication and to support people to let them know this is what data curation looks like and this is your checklist and this is where you can put it. Just uh, both education and hopefully tech technological support, I think, I think can go a long way towards getting better compliance with these policies. That being said, I guess it's also important for this data that becomes public that there's some sort of certification or curation, uh, you know, because sometimes the data sets themselves may be faulty and may be reused and reused for research that could be reproducing some sort of narrow training and whatnot, which is quite often the case. And I don't know if there's a way to do best practices that ensure such a quality. Of, this, uh, of these data sets, but it probably should be something that needs to be done eventually. It would be great to have some, uh, you know, like uh, paper and everything, simulation in the repository, and then you just type uh, make, and you get out of this uh, so command, you get the simulation results, and of course the paper, maybe if it's written in, in LaTeX, probably you can do it in Word, I guess it would be a bit more difficult. Uh, yeah, I know that I know people that have been doing this. Uh, of course, if you have to run a simulation on a supercomputer, that would not be feasible, I guess. Um, but uh, the idea is nice. And, um, but, but, yeah. but I think it shouldn't be an excuse, right? That's exactly the point, because quite often we do, at least in our field, quite often that cut, right? At a moment that we're like, oh, now it's too big, I, I actually stop the reproducibility and uh, no, don't no, do no, 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 it's not. No, I'm just saying that, of course, you have to, to make it feasible for, for yourself. And it's not, I mean, if you type make every time that you have rerun everything, no, of course, yes. It was just an example, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I totally agree. I think it's also very nice uh, um, 
because, of course, yeah, you can you read the publication, you can take the code, and you can run the experiment yourself and then improve. That, that's extremely nice. It's also nice from the, uh, the point of view of the author, maybe the student, uh, whoever uh, did the code, uh, to try to improve in writing the code, because he knows that the code is going to be online. Someone is going to be read, to read the code, uh, so you maybe want to add some comments. And if you do the code for yourself, sometimes it's just, you know, it's code. You run, maybe you run some blocks, uh, then you, you have multiple versions of the file. I mean, everyone has a different strategy in uh, doing coding. But if you know that this is going to be online and someone is going to read it, hopefully, hopefully, because that's the point of doing research, uh, then maybe you also want to be more careful in documenting the code. And that's very helpful also for you, because 10 years from now, you're going to take that code again, and uh, it's like, uh, OK, yeah, it's very helpful, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, I find myself very often taking mm -hmm. my, my scripts from my data repositories again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something else is just, uh, if, it is, if your data set is being shared and people are reusing it, I, I hope that they're maybe paying attention to the provenance <laughs> of that data. Um, a project that I worked on was the reproducibility project psychology, and we shared our data and our whole methodology. Um, and plenty of people have actually used that for their own analysis, and they, they take it and report new results, but we've also gotten criticism from mm. it. They have disagreed with how we did that process. But part of how they're able to do that is that we had a clear code book and we had strong documentation of what we were doing, and so they're able to point and say, I disagree with your approach here. And then online, other people can see these varied perspectives mm. on that one piece of research as well. Yeah, I think it's important to allow for such channels and such a dialogue, actually, and not be afraid of criticism and, you know, just get, otherwise we're stuck with stiff structures that just don't work very easily. And the validation of data, yeah, synthetic data, for example, mm -hmm. validation of those data sets, that that's a research principle in itself. Right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So it should be part of some sort of best practice yeah. guideline, for sure. Mm -hmm. Also, I would say, maybe adding a very small note, that in the last maybe five, ten years, I've seen that uh, containers actually helped a lot in doing uh, in reproducibility, because it's our experience, of course, that the code doesn't run on a new version of Python version or, or C++ version. So if you have C code, Fortran code, probably it's fine, I guess. Uh, but uh, even C++ code, of course, that uh, usually doesn't compile after five or ten years. It's a new version of new standard. So that's actually quite... I, I don't know how it's going to be with, with Python, because we use a lot of packages here and there, and they change so quickly that I guess it's a, it's a must now to go with containers, because otherwise it's impossible to ensure that. Yeah. yeah. But, I, but I wonder quickly, did we answer the question about democratizing access to compute? Um, so your question was about cloud resources, just to, to wrap this up. So the, I think there's actually two things to that, right? I think we need to continue to build lighthouse projects and build big HPC systems. Otherwise, we will not have the challenge to get scalable codes that run actually uh, new parts. But we, from similar projects in the US, like the Jetstream project is one that's an NSF-funded activity. They can get uh, like mid-scale access to cloud resources for universities. I think it's exactly that what we need. We need to get timely access for researchers from all fields, from universities, to the latest GPUs so they can try their algorithms, to whatever the latest hardware is, FPGAs likewise, or quantum devices uh, as well, when they're available. And cloud is a very convenient and effect effective way to, to share that. Yes. There are no more questions from the audience. Maybe I can ask our panelists to just leave us with the last message you would like to yeah, leave uh, yeah, the audience with on this topic. Who would like to go first? It's an unprepared question, so it's tough. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I go first. How can we enhance intercommunity collaboration? I think it really starts already at, at people that are already in our field. It starts with training the trainers. Because the moment you think about what do we want to approach next, what do we want to research next, the moment that we write our proposals, we have to take exactly this collaboration aspect into account. I will not have, like the cool example that I made at the beginning, like I will not have an artist PhD student in my, in my team if I don't think about it while I ask for resources. Um, I will not have the possibility to collaborate with someone if I don't pay them, right? They also have to, <laughs> have to do their science with a pay grade. Um, so yeah, it has to start actually, I think, with training the trainers. 
I think just something that I'm hoping to see is more roles opening up in science and maybe not uh, laying all the responsibilities on a tenure track professor, but asking more those research groups to expand and introduce a project manager, bring a data management specialist mm -hmm. to your department. Um, all of these different different roles have a real like value add to research. A project manager can make a big difference in your productivity and your citations. Uh, so yeah, I hope I hope we get to see science open up in uh, in terms of skill set and the size of our teams in a way that I think we haven't quite been talking about yet. Right. So um, community engagement, you know, it's it's a work in progress, right? So. Uh, a lot needs to be done, um, but we need to have the conversation going. For example, in the U.S., in the U.S. Congress, for, uh, recently there has been a series of hearings about what impact and involvement should society have in, in AI, um, uh, re AI research. Uh, and the regulatory agencies are all... Um, you know, trying to come up with a framework for that. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a work in progress, but it's a very much uh, on everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I agree with you. Um, yeah, I was thinking that uh, in, indeed uh, there is still, uh, there are still some barrier to 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 be, uh, uh, say, be crossed in, in terms of. Uh, uh, for instance, when you have, uh, but when you're dealing with with, uh, with students from different uh, from different uh, different background, uh, no, thinking, for instance, biomedical engineers, it's, uh, for them uh, it's it's difficult to approach uh, uh, scientific computing, so HPC resources, uh, and so how do we help them to, to to do research in our in our field, not my specific field, but it is in general. Uh, uh, with current tools, I think we, we are improving quite a lot since the last uh, five or ten years. Uh, last, time, the last day we were discussing about Jupiter, for instance, now to share notebooks uh, uh, that's much easier than to interact, uh, interact with them because you can see the code, the uh, pictures. So, yeah, I think we have plenty of tools to, to, to work in, uh, in, in this, uh, this direction. In terms of society, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. That's a tough question. I guess, but uh, yeah, well, I'll think about it and, uh, for the next time, I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, no, we have some, uh, uh, I mean, we discussed this uh, already, but um, yeah, through education, for instance, or... Uh, or we meet or again we next year to find out. <laughs> yeah. say, say again? Or we meet again next year in past. <laughs> ah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so with this, I, I want to thank our panel very much for the very nice discussions. I invite you to congratulate them as they leave our stage. <laughs> thank you.